right. We are going to be diving into the question of a man of God enters God's rest. Now, entering God's rest last week, we went through man of God walks in peace and what that looks like. How can we have peace that in the midst of trials, in the midst of craziness, and I've already had questions like, so what happened with your house? You know, did it collapse? You know, what's going on? Yeah, it's, and thank you for thinking about me. I appreciate that because it was, I mean, it's so true. If you're going to lead and deliver a message, God is going to just graciously give you opportunities to really apply everything you're trying to study. So that was this for me with the house, with the, um, God help me see the, the blessing inside of the craziness that the, um, the older gentleman that we had dig a trench because all the water coming in and, and we're like, ah, oh, it's like this water's filling our basement. Nobody can figure out where it's coming from. And is it the roof leak? Is it whatever? The insurance is like, oh, we're not covering that because it's groundwater. I don't know, whatever that means. But anyway, the, the thing that was a blessing inside of it, this older guy that I had hired to dig a trench to take all that groundwater away from the house, he was digging that trench and that's when he found and because he's older, he's like 85 and he's digging and he's, he stopped and he said, you know what, this just doesn't look right. And he started kind of digging around, do you mind if I look into this and started digging around? That's when he found the pillars that were eaten away. And he just told me today, I said, man, I'm so grateful that you found that. He said, yeah. He said, if that would have gone two more years, this house would have collapsed. I was like, Praise Jesus for the flood <laughs> that, that caused us to even look there. We'd have never looked and to hire this guy. So God is merciful in finding that. So it's still in the process, but I just today drove by. I'm like, wow, there's no piles and huge holes anymore. It's like we stuff do grass, but it's, praise God, it's, it's in the process. But again, exactly. But that's the same thing in our lives, though. Isn't God will reveal something and dig something out of us, and then we find it's like, oh, this is some painful thing. But then God uses that to unearth it, to fix it. And that's one of the things that God showed me in this message, too, that entering in God's rest. Just came back from a, um, a conference, a Christian conference in Connecticut. And we flew in, and, and these guys, crazy. It's like, um, if... I use the example with my kids, Messi and Ronaldo. I don't know if you guys are into soccer. that probably don't. But anyway, whoever the top two athletes are, top of their game, if they would have a conference and like, hey, we're just going to sit down and share all our knowledge and how we, we um, have been successful over the years, that how big would that be? It would be huge. Well, that's what these guys in the business realm are huge. And it's interesting. They came and there was just 25 of us. It was about this size of room. And the one guy was sharing, he's like, he said, not to be ungrateful, he said, I'm used to speaking to 10,000 at a time. He said, 25 is a, a little humbling. He said, because God's done such amazing things with my business. And he said, I get, I speak all over the world. But he said, because of this topic specific, it's not so much about business tactics, but it's about how to have Christ in your business and how to do business with a Christ-centered focus. And he said, it's, it's not as popular as, you know, how to have a million dollar business in three months. And, and he said, it's, it's interesting, but the main thing that dug into me, that just like my house, that he dug in, he was like, you know what, it's, it's not about, you know, doing things better. He said, you gotta get your head out of it and you gotta walk in the spirit. You gotta just trust God and just walk in his word and trust his principles and walk in it. And he said, that's where we've seen miraculous exponential growth. You know, he is, both these guys have multiple businesses that they run, but one of them is chiropractic. And, and they did that. They have the largest chiropractic offices in the entire world. This one guy sees 4,000 patients a week by himself. He's like Moses, 4,000. Yeah. And he just came back from a, um, a missionary trip to um, Dominican Republic, and he adjusted 4,000 in a day. And he was crazy. It's like, all right, how is that? But they were seeing miracles. It was just crazy stuff. And they were sharing how walking in the Spirit, that God just does miracles when we walk in the Spirit. And 
He said, but there's something in the way, something that stops you. And that's what I felt. It was like that rotted part of my house that I didn't even know was rotting, that, that I didn't know it until we dug in. And when they started digging into scripture and just walking in faith that these guys were amazing, that it just really revealed to me, it's like, wow, I'm studying all this about walking in God's rest and in God's rest. I'm like, I am so far from this that there's a, a peace in me that I'm wrestling with. So again, this is something God's been teaching me and there's a couple aspects of this that really God tied in. So we are going to jump into some different things here that I want somebody to, let's jump to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to go all the way back. First book, Genesis chapter 2. Yeah, exactly. If I can find it with you. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 2 and 3. All right. And I'll start with verse 1. Thus, chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. Verse 2. And by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And when we see that God rested from all his work, he also, a little bit later in, um, in Genesis, that we see um, that Genesis 2.15, a couple verses down, 15, it says, then God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and cultivated to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. And um, for in the day you shall eat it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. And then the um, God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden and had fellowship with them. Now, it's interesting that God rested on the seventh day, then he created Adam and Eve and had fellowship with them and, and had them rest in his garden, that there's two words that were fascinating that came out of that, that the word Sabbath, you hear that, you know, seventh day Sabbath, but the word rest in Hebrew means um, Shabbat. And I remember that from, we used to go to a Christian Jewish service where the um, the the Christian Jews would get together on Saturday and they'd have a thing called Shabbat and, and just what the regular um, Jews did, but even the Christian Jews still celebrated Shabbat. And the word actually Shabbat means to like clock out, like you clock in for work and you clock out and work's done, I'm done. That's what Shabbat means is to clock out, and no more work. But then when God kind of walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, that that resting with God there is a word that's um, called nuach. And nuach means to kind of settle in or rest or um, the, how they describe it. It's more like you um, come in and you pack your bags to go visit relatives and you unpack and you rest. You're like, all right, we're here for the weekend. We're resting and we just want to fellowship and get to know everybody. That's that nuach. Now, that whole thing with um, Sabbath and, and those two words it's interesting how that all ties in with the Sabbath, but then the Jews kind of took it to a totally different level where they had rules of what can you do on the Sabbath? What does work actually mean? You can carry something on the back of your hand, but you can't carry it on the palm of your hand. If you carry it on the back of your hand, it's not really work. If you carry it on the palm of your hand, that's actually work. They got crazy with it. And, you know, a Sabbath day journey, you can walk this far, but you can't walk any farther. And then Jesus came in when they really came after him and, and were like, hey, your disciples are eating on the Sabbath, they're you know, doing work. And he said, hey, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That God actually made this for you to rest and it's for you to do good on the Sabbath, not for you to do evil. And, and that's where God was convicting me about this. Like, all right, Sabbath, this is really fascinating with this. And, and the question came up, it's like, all right, I'm a Christian, you know, Paul kind of goes into it that, 
that we shouldn't judge each other by new moon celebrations or Sabbaths or anything, that we're supposed to have freedom in Christ. But where does this Sabbath rest come in? Do we still have to do it or do we not? You know, where does that, that rest really come in? And this is where I was really diving into this, that, that, um, that God has given us a command to rest back with the Jews and he kind of said it, but then there's a a way where we can go either way with it. And I've looked up so many things. There's debates back and forth. There's people like, no, like here's the the one side. Go ahead and turn to um, Colossians 2.16. And... Colossians 2.16 goes into, and Paul is really trying to, to hammer down what Jesus was talking about, that you know we've got to really watch what we do when we're judging each other, and when we're kind of comparing each other, kind of like the, the Jews, it's like, oh, who's more righteous? You know, They had all these rules, and if you follow more of these rules, you're more righteous than somebody else, and that's what Paul was kind of combating that. And Colossians 2.16 Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or what you drink or with regard to your religious festivals, a new moon celebration, or even a Sabbath day. These are shadows of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. I'm like, okay, I'm wrapping my brain around that. I'm like, this is the, another scripture talks about even the, the, um, the temple that, that God told Moses to, you know, how he wanted the the tabernacle in the wilderness and even Solomon's temple, how God gave him specific instructions how to build it, that that is just a shadow of what's truly in heaven, that this is just kind of a carbon copy of it. It's a, a shadow of what is really going on, but that our reality is Jesus Christ and the true temple is here. The true rest is Jesus Christ but it's like we throw out the baby with the bathwater. That we throw out, it's like, well, we don't have to do all those celebrations, so let's do nothing. And let's not do anything at all. And we lose sight of, well, we still need to stop work and rest and be in God's presence and hear from God. We still need to do that. But it's just, we're kind of thrown off the restrictions, like, oh, we can only do that on the Sabbath. Oh, we can only do that when we're at the temple. Oh, we can only do it. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I'm with you always. You can do it anytime. You can do it anywhere. But instead of us taking like, great, we can do this all the time. Now we hardly do it at all. And because we've thrown it out. And that's what God was convicting me, that kind of rotten pillar in my house. That's what I was feeling. I thought I was doing good, do my devotions in the morning and everything. And then I started looking at this. Am I really walking in God's rest? Am I really walking in, in the peace of Jesus? And people looking at me and like, man, you're different because you just have this peace of supernatural peace. I'm like, wow, you know, at times when I'm in my devotions in the morning, but do I walk in that? Do I take Christ with me all day long and, and have that peace with me everywhere? Or is it just at certain times when I'm really studying and in God's presence, when I'm worshiping, it's like, oh, that's great. And see, even sharing music, that's great. That's worshiping, perfect. <laughs> now we have this where we don't have to be tied to a specific thing, but then we get into the, um, if we're not tied into it, but how are we actually doing it? How am I doing it? And that's where coming into the practical side, I'm like, all right, guys, family, we're going to practice a Sabbath day of rest. And the kids are like, what? It's like, what does that mean? And then I caught myself. I felt like I was being one of the Jews. Okay, well, here are the rules. Well, you know, can I play video games on the Sabbath? Because that's rest for me. I'm like, okay, no, that's not rest. And it's like, oh, can I, can I read a book? Can I paint? Can we watch movies on the Sabbath? What if they're Christian movies? Is that like a Sabbath rest? I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally get why the, the Jewish leaders like had to lay out all these rules because I got bombarded with questions. And I mean, even myself, I was asking myself, I'm like, oh, I just want to watch a movie right now. You know what? I just, this is how I unplug. And I got slammed this weekend because 
one of the guys, again, talking about that pillar that was rotten in my heart. I'm like, oh, he said, all right, as when you have something like something rotten, something that's a pain, some something that's really deep in your soul that's a, an ache, a hurt, like somebody hurt you, like what Pastor talked about, somebody wronged you, and you've got that in you. It's like, how do you deal with that? And he just hit me between the eyes. It's like, do you run to like escape and watch movies just to veg out? I'm like, maybe. <laughs> and he's like, or, and he took it further. He said, or, do you run to drugs? Do you run to alcohol? Do you run to pornography? Do you run to, you know, affairs? Because you're just, you're not satisfied with where you are. And you look to get peace all these other places. But he said, we have the peace of God himself in Jesus Christ available to us. And we're not running to the source of peace and life. <laughs> like, right, that would be the right answer. So... I told kids, all right, we're going to do this. Let's come on and do it and, and take one day. You know, God talks about the tithe. You know, we're supposed to, let's take a tenth and, you know, give it to God as an offering because he gave us 100%. We could at least give 10% back. And that's where um, a friend of mine, that's my accountability partner, said the same thing. He said, you should consider your time as a tithe. And he's He's an accountant, so he like factored out how many hours are in a week. And you know, if we calculate how many hours, that it's actually a full day. That and it was actually like a day and a half. But he was like, "This many hours, you should be tithing back to God." I'm like, "Okay, you know, I'll, let's just try a day." And so we did that, and it was it was interesting. It revealed a lot. And this is my humble thing that I tried to simplify things. I. Some of this stuff gets super deep, and I'm sure if you have deep questions, ask John Eck. He will be able to dive into the Greek and Hebrew for you. If you've got those deeper questions, I'm a simple guy. So I tried to simple it down. I love Jesus' words when he said, the law and the prophets are all hung on two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So I told the kids, all right, this is how we're going to apply this. Does this, whatever we're doing, does it help us to love God and focus on him and, and rest and just, you know, tell stories about how awesome God is and, and what he's done in the miracles? Let's read the miracle stories in the Bible. Let's read missionary stories where God's done miracle things. I mean, that's cool. If it draws us into him and helps us be in awe of him, looking at the stars, you know, let's be in awe of God. If it does that, man, love the Lord your God with our heart, mind, and soul. And I said, but it's not that we're just going to lay around and not do anything. I said, or love your neighbors yourself. Let's go serve somebody else. Let's go do something for somebody else. Let's take one day and not think of ourselves because I'm one of the chief ones that thinks of me a lot. So that was tough for me too. I was like, all right, let's focus outward instead of inward on one day. Let's just try it. And it's been a whole lot harder than I ever thought. It was. We've only done it two Sundays. And it's been crazy. We had a lot of crying in the beginning, and I won't tell you who cried, but it was, a lot of it was me. Yeah, it was me. I know. That's, sorry, I was trying to say. But anyway, <laughs> the um, second Sunday, we started getting a rhythm like, huh, this is kind of cool. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that some of the stuff that drew us away, and one of the things, ah, oh, this is painful. One of the things was this. And again, at the, the seminar, this guy, he... One of the, the guys that's huge, he said, guys, he said, we are being attacked. This is a spiritual attack from Satan, getting our minds off of God and being in God's presence, letting him use us to do miracles. And what he's using is the eye of Satan. He said, this is the eye of Satan. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, wow. And I woke up the next morning, could not, so it was like three o'clock in the morning and God was just like, it's true in my life. It's true. And what I pictured was the, um, the Lord of the Rings. You guys remember Gollum and the ring of power and all that. And that what was Gollum doing? He got it. And he was this river folk, super nice guy. You know, they're all about, you know, community fishing together. And he got a hold of that ring and he got that ring and it suddenly, oh, it stirred something in him. And he killed his friend over it. And then he got it and he was like, oh, you know, my precious. And then what did it do? It drew him away from everybody. 
And it just tormented him, twisted him, and it gave him pleasure, like stroking it and holding on to it. But then it drew him into the cave, away from everybody else, and it just poisoned his mind. And all I could picture was this phone, and I'm watching my family, and all of us are sitting around, and it's like, oh, my precious, my precious. And even when they tried to take the ring away from him, remember what happened? He was like, it just, he became like crazed. And I've done that with my kids. I'm like, all right, guys, you've been on that two phone. Give me the phone. And it's like, I'm like, whoa, where is that coming from? You know what? It's like I'm ripping their arm off trying to just, no, I'm just, let's just set them aside here for a bit. You know, let's just put aside and not get into it. And it's crazy how this just pollutes us. And that's where we tried to set that down. And God's been convicting me more about that. You can keep asking me about that, how I'm dealing with the eye of Satan here. But the, um, it was just interesting that that was one of the things that's just drawing us away and, and polluting us. And even one of the things that they talked about this weekend, that there's a study in Europe, um, some neurologist, that they were watching that just even the phones and everything, like even how I'm right now, how we're hunched over and we're doing this for hours at a time on the phone, that when your head is tipped forward like that, it puts pressure on your brainstem. And they did these MRIs and EMGs, and they're looking, and it cuts off the blood supply to your frontal lobe. And it, um, it cuts off the cerebrospinal fluid from flowing around your brain. And they tied and they listed all these side effects. And one of them was um, schizophrenia and um, depression, that it just... It draws you down and it causes you to just pull into yourself. And it truly, the, um, one of the things cutting off the blood supply to your frontal lobe, that's where your logic center is. And uh, the same thing they're saying with the phone that, you know, and I saw with my kids. Then I'm like, you've been on that for two hours. No, I haven't. It's only been a couple minutes. It's been two hours. And when we looked at your frontal lobe, that's where your time center is, where you keep track of time in your brain. And when that blood supply gets cut off, you literally lose track of time. And what seems like a few minutes has been hours. And that's the same thing on video games that I've done, actually, a ton of study on how video games do, do that, but that it's really sucking us in. So here's what God's been challenging me with is... We spend so much time working. And when we're guys, we're like, all right, I've got to provide for my family. I've got to work. What can we do to do that? But then going back and focusing in, all right, what's my relationship like with God? What's my time with him? Am I resting in him? Or am I being sucked in? And man, I'm being sucked in. And God's like pulling me away from this. And resting in him, turning off work, spending time with family, pulling the kids out of the video game cave. And I was talking like, guys, everybody's like pulling away from the room. And even if we're sitting in the room together, you're not really talking because everybody's doing this and everybody's, you know, not communicating. It's like, all right, let's put them down, put them out of the room and let's just talk. Let's just share, you know, hey, what was the sermon about? You know, what convicted you? You know, what, how can we apply this? What was cool? What was bad? What questions do you have? You know, how can we serve? What's going on? You know, what can we do to truly get to know God more? And it's been really interesting. We've had some better conversations the second day and not as many tears on my part. So it was good. So, but going into the um, rest, I truly saw what God kind of pulled out even in Genesis where God longs to spend time with us. And it's like God's there waiting to spend time and just the distractions are so great. It's hard to cut things out and it's hard to pull away from stuff, but it's looking at the cost versus the benefit. That it's like, what am I giving up to spend this time with God, but what am I gaining by spending time with God and with family and serving others and, and how can we dive in. So I've got some questions for you guys as well. And the last part is, is what God really hit me with was these last things is Hebrews three and four. And I'm going to blaze through this, just flip to Hebrews. And 
I'm just going to give you guys the full conviction God give, gave me, so I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to share that conviction with all you guys so we can all enjoy the conviction together. Hebrews chapter 3. Now, this is where, in mean, Hebrews chapter 3, um, and they're not sure who the writer of Hebrews was. They think it's Paul. The majority of people think it's Paul. But again, if you have a question in detail, I'll have John Eck answer that one for you. Um, but anyway, the point is, is going into, as a believer, what do we need to do? And it's even talking about the, that Sabbath rest. I mean, it goes into detail. This is, it talks more about rest in Hebrews 3 and 4 than anywhere else. I mean, I kept, when I kept looking at rest, it kept taking me back to Hebrews 3 and 4. So with this, starting with the first part in Hebrews, let me start with verse 3. There we go. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than even Moses, just as the builder of the house is greater than the house itself. For, even, um, for every house is built by someone, God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, bearing witness to what um, would have been spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if we indeed hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which um, we glory. Now, here's the convicting part. Now, so... As the Holy Spirit says, verse 7, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. And I feel like the last few months I've been in some wilderness testing. Now, verse 9, Where your ancestors tested and tried me um, through, or though for 40 years they saw what I did, and that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, in their, or their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared um, on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Now that's the rest. He was talking about the promised land and entering rest. But here's where Paul, it's like, no, nah, it's not just the inner rest of the promised land. He said, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, it's interesting, that Hebrews verse 13, 313, I quote that all the time. You know, it's like, oh, we got to get together and meet together. And it's a, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It's like, oh, yeah, we got to get together. And I'm looking, I'm like, that's not just talking about getting together. But when he says as long as it's called today, it's talking about entering in God's rest. And that as we fellowship in our uh, our focus on God and our focus in serving others. I'm like, oh, that's a little different than what I actually thought that was. We have come to share in Christ if we indeed hold um, our original conviction firmly to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who, um, who were there, who, who were they who hardened um, and rebelled or who heard and rebelled? Were they not those uh, Moses led out of Egypt and with whom um, was angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies are um, uh, perished in the wilderness? Or another version said, strewn across the wilderness. And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not those who disobeyed? So we see um, that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. It's like, okay, God, like, it's where he's convicting me on this, that they didn't follow God, they didn't believe him, they didn't trust him, that, man, 
There's a promised land. Trust me, there's this promised land. You can do it. I can do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine. I know it looks like there are giants in that land, and you're not going to really be able to enter it. Trust me. And they didn't. They're like, Psh, no, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to the stuff we know and where there's food and all this stuff. And they turned away from God. Now, that entering rest, I'm like, okay. It's talking about entering God's rest in his presence. And that takes me back to that Sabbath. It's like, oh, I got so much work I got to get done. I can't take time to rest and not do anything on Sunday. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, God knows what we got to get done. We've got stuff at the house. We got stuff that needs to be repaired. We got all this stuff. I mean, we got to get it done. And that's where I have a unbelieving heart that I'm turning away from God. It's like, trust me. And that's what just like Caleb and, and Joshua is like, no, God can provide. We can take this time to rest. I'm like, oh, like, so then it goes into to more detail in chapter four, but it really goes into the detail in chapter four of that if we trust God, and here's, I just want to jump to four, eight. This was the thing that, that really floored me. Starting in eight, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would have spoken later about another day or wouldn't have spoken um, about another day later. Uh, then he says, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that none of you will perish by following their example of disobedience. I'm like, wow. I don't remember reading that before, that, you know, following their disobedience and not resting in God's presence. And then the crazy thing, I've quoted this other verse a ton too. Right after that, you jump into verse 12. So we're wrestling with this, okay, entering God's rest, being obedient, that he talks in chapter four about, you know, the, the day that he's talking about today and today with Christ, that that's where we have that rest with Christ any day. And then verse 12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing um, soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the attitudes and thoughts of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give an account. That verse takes on a whole new meaning now. Before I was like, oh yeah, God's scripture is so cool. We're at, you know, divide soul and spirit. Looking at that now, I'm like, oh, I hadn't read that in context, where it's talking about trusting and going into God's presence and resting is, you got to do it because, and then it goes in, God's word is sharper than a double-edged sword, that in God's presence, when we're resting with him and listening to him, man, talk about being divided soul and spirit. My wife can attest, she's like, Wow you've been heavy lately. And I said, yeah. I said, God's been cutting some crazy stuff out of me. I didn't realize I had some of this rotten, like I said, that rotten pillar in my heart. I didn't know it was there until I'm resting in God's presence. Oh, this is going to be great. Rest. It's going to be awesome. And then God's like, oh, you're finally here. You're finally listening. Great. Let me start trenching out some of the stuff and I'm going to show you what's underneath there. I'm like, whoo, like, wow. But it's been really cool. It's it's once you get it fixed and it's painful, just like our house, now that it's fixed, it's like, oh, great. Okay, it's not going to collapse. <laughs> you know, we've got some good foundation. And that's what God's been showing me, that in his presence and as he digs some of these old hurts that I didn't even realize I was hanging on to and that's colored my thinking and almost everything, that getting down and trusting God with some of the hurts and hangups that I've had and, and like some of the stuff like at, Again, God keeps waking me up at three o'clock in the morning. That some stuff when I was a kid, I and I'm going to end on this. That um, that I was a bone marrow transplant when I was five years old. I had a bone marrow transplant. They stuck a needle in me, you know, a hundred times in my pelvis. Gave bone marrow to my sister, and I was in the hospital. And and some of the stuff that came back to me that I didn't even know what was bothering me was I had just this flash as I'm at three o'clock in the morning, just laying there and like, all right, God what is this that's like, I feel something in me, kind of like that rotten pillar. And it was that fear that I had this picture of, there was five nurses holding me down to um, stick these needles in me. And I was screaming my head off. And I remembered as a five-year-old laying on that bed screaming. And it was like, 
there was nothing I could do. You scream all you want. You're not going to get any help. And that's colored my thinking where, you know what, you run into a problem, you know what, I back off, you know, can't do anything. And my wife's like, why don't you fight for stuff? Why don't you just keep rolling over and let people do it? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what it is. And then God's revealing, it's like, oh yeah, that was back there. But in taking the scripture that it's sharper than a two-edged sword, that what God taught me is that where was Jesus there? That I'm using a five-year-old's mentality to make these leaps and assumptions as a 50-year-old and going back, no, what's God's view of me then? Was I helpless just like Job? Was he helpless? No, God had a plan. Job didn't understand and he was screaming out like, why? You know, what's going on? And God came down and was like, you don't need to understand. You need to trust me. There's a purpose in this. Rest in me and trust me. You don't, you won't understand why I did it. And God didn't actually explain to Job why he did it. He just said, and he said, look at how great I am and you can't even comprehend it. And he was like, sorry, I won't say anything else. Okay, I'm done. So, and I'm done too. So what we've got questions for you guys is just to dive in and just ask, okay, God, how do you want me to apply this? Is this worth it to take time away and try to spend a day, you know, baby steps, try to spend an hour, you know, just in God's presence and rest and listen and let him work on us so that we can be the godly men that he's called us to be.